so uh, as the title says, uh, this um, uh, webcast is about taking SOLIDWORKS CAM probing to the next level. Uh, the idea behind this is uh, not necessarily to teach the, the basics of the probing itself. We will cover a little bit of it, but um, I want to go ahead and explore and kind of uh, show you what you can do with the probing. Um, so in essence, taking it to the next level. So, but before we get into it um, and before we start, uh, I want to go ahead and propose a hypothetical job for you guys, the audience. Okay. So I want you to uh, take in what I'm showing you here and think about it as we go through this uh, whole presentation. It's a hypothetical job, and we're going to rework holes by skimming 100 thou off the side walls. And it's an alloy of, quote unquote, unobtainium, just some crazy exotic alloy, really difficult to deal with. So we, we try and keep the feeds and speeds conservative and about a 50 thou depth of cut max to preserve tool life. And these holes come in all kinds of different sizes with no rhyme or reason to it. It's just a, a grab bag of, of different uh, holes. So um, you have to consider that. And the job volume is in the thousands. So I'm going to let this marinate with you guys as we go through the next half hour or more. Um, and just think about this as we're uh, going through what we're going through. So. The key takeaways from what we're going to cover today, uh, hopefully you learned some of the basics of the probing, uh, what it's for, how we use it, or, uh, a little bit of a quick demo, and then we're going to dive into the macros that power the probing sequences. Uh, I call them the 9,000 macros, um, what they do, how, how they create positional outputs in your machine. And then the last part of it would be about taking those, that information and automating processes. So the idea is to, to take information from the probes and do more, have the machine actually make decisions for you. And at the end of all of this, the, the, the job that I had talked about just a moment ago, we'll revisit that and see what we learned in the last half hour and see what we can apply to it. Okay. All right. So a little bit about myself, um, uh, five axis military guy, EDM, uh, live tooling, et cetera, et cetera. These are some of the companies I've worked for, but the most important thing that I want you guys to take away from me is that I have a biochem degree that I've never used. <laughs> I, I um, happened into machining and manufacturing by accident as a side job, but I fell in love with it um, and it's given me great opportunities. And I'm trying to pay it forward to everybody else, especially with, within machining because uh, the workforce is aging out. So if anybody out there has questions, just wants uh, you know to talk shop, or anything like that. Um, you know, by all means, just contact me. My email will be at the end of the, the presentation. I'd be uh, happy to help. So, what is probing? <clears throat> probing it's it's become an established best practice for maximizing the efficiency, quality, capability, and the accuracy of your machine tools. So it's a tool, and that's what you see here. It's a probe that makes contact with your material and it records that position as data for use. Now, SOLIDWORKS CAM probing is powered by Renishaw Inspection Plus. So it, it's a library of macros that has to be present in your machine and your CNC equipment in order to use SOLIDWORKS CAM probing. But if you have it and you happen to have SOLIDWORKS CAM professional or higher, then you'll have probing capability uh, as of 2020. So what are the general uses for a probe? You can do setups like creating work coordinate offsets, um, setting your G54, G55. You can do fail safe operations. So you can send a probe to say, follow a drill uh, to ensure that the hole is actually there before running a tap. You can identify parts, use a probe to gather the dimensional data that can identify that part. You can do in process control, like checking say a machine feature for dimensional accuracy so that um, it can allow you to adjust and correct out of tolerance features in the middle of process. So if you machine a boss and it's too big, you can probe and uh, somehow take that information and remachine that area right after you've machined it to make sure that you come out with a good part. You also have first off part inspection, just running a first article in the machine, and then also a final inspection, which is kind of the same thing, but the final part. All right, so here we're going to get into a, a little bit of a demo, a uh, live demo, 
to kind of show you how to do or how to create a, a probing cycle in SOLIDWORKS CAM. So I have a part here, and uh, I happen to have CAMWORKS open, but SOLIDWORKS CAM and CAMWORKS are identical products. Um, so you can do it the same way I'm doing it now. And uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, usually you should have your features already uh, created with your um, part setup here. And as soon as you have a mill part setup, you can go into your operation tree. And once in the operation tree, you can go ahead and right click your mill part setup here. And then I'm going to go ahead and select this probing operation. It's going to ask what tool to use. So I happen to have a probe tool here. So I'll green check that and say OK. And as soon as I have that done, it's going to open up all my probing parameters. And here it's pretty simple. Like uh, probing is basically making contact with your material. So if you look at your model, you have all these faces here. You're going to go ahead and select the face that you want to actually touch. So in this case, let's pretend I just want to do a Z pickoff and establish my Z0 at the top of this face right here. So I'll go ahead and set this to single face and touch that. And as you can see, it's created a, a probing path to that face. Now, it may not be perfect. It isn't always perfect in terms of the location, but that can be adjusted by simply moving your X location and Y location. Currently, it's at its default, but I can adjust this by moving it around. Uh, if you notice, I clicked that, and it moved about 10 millimeters in the X direction. So that should uh, you know, probe pretty uh, easily there. Once I'm done with that, I can set a couple things. I can do a uh, update a work set off, uh, work offset here. If I click that, I can go ahead and set my G54 if I wanted to, or 55, 56, whatever you want it to do, or even do a subcoordinate too. Or you can just do the probing without changing anything at all. And what it does is do the sequence, but store the information, but not do anything in terms of changing a value. If there are any additional parameters that you want to deal with in terms of clearances and all of that, you can go to your NC tab here. And this allows you to adjust your rapid planes, your clearance planes, and the probe cycle plane. So I'll run it one, one more time. And I'm going to go ahead and do an XY. So again, we're going to set this to something uh, automatic here. I'll go click automatic and automatic on XY. And we can do something like this hole here. So I'll just click this face here. And it gives me a nice uh, four-point bore cycle. All I had to do was just click the face, and it came up with that. And uh, I can change the uh, depth of my Z if I want to, to pick up a little higher or lower or whatever. That is pretty much uh, your probing cycle there. So let me go back to the Z, though, because I just want to do a single point pickup. We're going to post this out. So I'm fine with that. I'll say OK. Uh, spindle speed greater than max speed. Do I wish to continue? That's fine. And we're going to post process to take a look at the uh, code itself. So when you create a probe cycle, and this is really just, just a probe cycle, you get this kind of G-code. And when you're looking at it, a lot of this makes sense. OK, you know, spindle, I could have changed this later or earlier in the uh, process. But OK, I got an M08, G90s, all my preparatory codes. But then I start seeing things like G65, P9832, P9810. What do these things mean? These are macros. These are the macros that power or um, run the probing commands. So something like P9832, I know actually turns on the probe. P9810 is considered a protective move. So what it does is it activates the probe. So while it's moving, if you accidentally make contact with something, it's going to alarm out and say, hey, you've made contact, rather than move without it being on, and you might snap the probe off. Uh, P9811 is the actual pickup cycle. P9810 moves out safely, and then you turn off your probe. So if you knew what these uh, macros were, it's pretty easy to understand. But a lot of times, people don't know. So that's where we're going to go into the macros. And I'm going to point out only a couple of them. There's just a ton of macros out there. And they're ever evolving. Um, and SOLIDWORKS CAM Pro doesn't provide access or um, the ability to use all the macros. It does a lot of the basic macros. 
But when you start getting to uh, complex, like vector style macros, that might be something you have to write by hand. But uh, here's an example of uh, just a single surface uh, macro right here, 9811. Anytime you see a 9811 command in your uh, G code, you're doing a single point pickup and it could be on X or Y or Z. Uh, over here, if you've got a web pocket measure, 9812. Uh, here's another one, a bore boss measure, 9814. These are just the commands there. And you know, this is, this is something that's nice to have if you wanna write your own macros. Renishaw, usually if you uh, purchased Renishaw Probe, you will have access to their manual. And I would stress to anybody who does do probing to you know, get a hold of the manual uh, so that you can see all the different probing uh, sequences and maybe even write your own code. But you know, these are examples. Now, what does it actually do? It does this, the, the sequence, as you can see here, but it also stores the code somewhere in, in your machine. And that is stored in your variable tables. So every single CNC machine out there, at least, Oh, I'd hope uh, some of the newer ones. I, I, I know that there could be some DRO based machines which just slapped on something. It may not have a table, but most of them have a variable table. And if you have a, a Renishaw, you definitely have a variable table. And go ahead and just poke around in your machine. You'll find it. It usually is labeled macros. And Renishaw reports out their values to certain numbers. And here's an example based off of uh, Mazak Integrex. Uh, these numbers may not be consistent with your brand of machine. It could be different from Haas to uh, Morisiki, but uh, somewhere these things are being stored. So if I run, if you remember that 9811, if I run a P9811 here, it's gonna store the values of that contact point into these variables. So 135, 136, 137. When I ran that code last time, it stored whatever I did into number 137. So once you have this, you can actually start programming and employing um, logic because you are gathering data and then using that data for your G code. So we're gonna go into an example of automation using this information here. We're gonna start with a part identification example. So here's a scenario where maybe I get a bunch of parts that were ran and they kind of have inconsistent sizes. So if I do that, I wanna be able to rerun a program um, that fixes those sizes, but with the appropriate type of program. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and just run through the code here. In the beginning, I have my normal uh, code for protected move. If you remember, 9810 was a protect, protected move. I have a 9811, which is a single surface measure. So I'm gonna measure something and I have a Z70 input here. So what I'm trying to do is move to what I think should be Z70. And if it makes contact, it'll actually record where it's at uh, in 137. So if whatever's in pound 137, here's an if statement, if it's greater than 73, so in theory, if my part was at 74, it's greater than 73, then I'm gonna to go to 100, line 100 in my program. That's my first filter. The second one, if that very same value is greater than 71, I'll go to line 200. And if that value is greater than 69, I would go to 300. So what does that mean? So let's pretend I had 74. If I had 74, I'm gonna to go to line 100. So I would run the program that's from line 100. And when that is done, I'm gonna go straight to 400, which ends the program. If my value happened to be 72, I would have bypassed this if statement because it is not greater than 73, but I would stop right here, go to program 200, and I would machine for program 200. So, and then the same thing again, if I had value 70, I would go to 300 once all these are, satisfied, I would move on and the program. Now, if it doesn't fit any of these, I just go straight to 400 and skip it, move on to the next program. So this is a way to identify your parts and send to a specific program. It doesn't have to be done this way. Um, your 
your language, your macro variable language could be um, different from machine to machine, the way how the syntax is. So uh, just because you see it here doesn't mean it's going to work exactly the same way in your machine. Uh, your ifs could be you know, required parentheses or whatnot. So from machine to machine, it could be different. But this is the general idea. This is the approach. So another example is uh, in-process control. So say you're machining something and you want to check immediately right after to make sure it's on point before moving on. Um, this can happen with, you know, earlier the drill tap scenario. I don't want to run a, uh, a, a tap if my drill size has worn to the point where it's too small, I could snap the tap. Or I might even send it in there to make sure that the drill's not even, uh, is still good and not broken, I'd be sending a tap into basically a solid block if that'd be the case. So these are the kind of things you can do. You can do it for you know, machining a flat surface and then checking that, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So and if you notice, there's a lot of different macros out there, um, uh, the sequences, probing sequences. So you can pick up off of boards, you can pick up off of bosses, uh, single points, all that stuff. You can make it do math and then figure out how much you need to adjust. So here's an example. Now, when I, when I start this example, I have a variable that I've chosen to use. And really, this is just a placeholder. Uh, in your machine, you should have at least variables 100 through 500, I believe, available. And oftentimes, even more than that. I'll choose 300 here. So 300 is just the, the variable that I'm just going to use for this particular example. And I do the typical uh, uh, protect and move and a single surface measure here. So from there, I'm going to take my value that I had gotten from the pickup. So 137 is my Z value pickup. And I'm going to subtract that by 70. If 70 is my nominal number, then what I'm doing is taking the results of the probing like say 74 minus 70, I have an error of four from 70. So keep that in mind. I've stored that error in variable 300 there. Now, if I take that error, which is four, I'm sorry, the, the actual pickup value, which is 74, if it's greater than 73, then I'm gonna go to, go to 100. And what this kind of means is that if if my value was 74 and 73 could be the very high of my tolerance, then it needs to be reworked. I can't let it go at 74. So let's send it back to machining, take care of that before we move on. So if the error is greater than 73, we're gonna to go to N100. And N100 reworks the, pro, the, the area with a new program or the same program, but with this variable in mind. So if my nominal was 70, and it's programmed to 70, but I'm four off, obviously something's wrong. Either my tool's got a lot of wear or you know, just something happened, part may have shifted, whatnot. So what I'm doing is taking my error uh, value, which was four, and subtracting this out of the 70. So I'm actually machining at 66, you know, in terms of my Z value, which would correct that four error once that's done, which I run the machine operation here, I can move on to N400. Uh, I do reset the variable. I don't want this left over for the next time I run the program. So I put it back to zero so that when you do this all over again, it's back to zero. And I, I overkill. I reset the variable here, reset the variable there. If for some reason you paused or stopped in the middle of the operation and just hit reset, it may not clear out that variable. So I always try to to be as careful as I can and just make sure I have resets. And that's that. So you've checked your part. You've uh, logged the amount of uh, out of tolerance uh, error. And then you've sent it back to remachine. And you remachined it with the uh, tolerance error in mind. So that's an in-process control example. Now, another option or another way to handle this. And you know what I show you and what I will be showing you today is not like you know a template for everybody to use. There's so many different ways to do the same thing. But you can add this value, this for error, to the uh, system variable that represents your tool offset. So instead of uh, adjusting your, your coordinates to your machine in the correct area, you can also adjust your tool offset. Every single bit of your machine has a system variable married to it. 
So your tool offsets has, say, in, hypothetically, or um, in this case, it's 5125. Somewhere in your machine, there's pound 5125, and it represents uh, length offset for tool four, or whatever it would be. Uh, the same thing goes for, you know, uh, diameter offsets, work locations, uh, wear offsets, etc. So you can adjust your offsets on the fly. And uh, if you have done a lot of machining, a lot of times with just you know tool wear, you just go to wear offset and add a thou or add a half thou or add a whatever. Um, that's the easiest way to just like fix it on the fly. So this is a way to have the machine automatically correct its tool wear. Uh, while in process, so that your next part, hopefully, uh, has the tool wear adjusted, so you just don't have to continuously uh, fix these variables. You just go ahead and say, hey, you know, this tool has already been set to a good wear, and uh, we, we move on. So that's an example. This whole thing is an example of in-process control, and again, more ways to do um, just one thing. So don't, don't consider this the only way. So here we are, we have kind of like automation examples and, and, you know, this is where automation happens. And so when you combine the use of your probing data with variables and uh, you use the system variables and you take advantage of all these things and you start getting into what, you know, the holy grail of everybody in the shop lights out machining, um, that's all possible with probing, with the use of the variables and employing them with, it, with logic. So. Uh, you know, hopefully you have the power now to check tools are in process. Uh, you can decide redundant tools. You can move work positions, check tool wear over time, switch from program to program automatically, prompt the operator via the machine control status. You do a pound 3000, that's usually a, a comment line right on the screen of your controller saying, hey, blah, 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 blah. Just put in the message there. You can communicate with manufacturing IoT, and this is big. If you are uh, users of the MT Connect uh, uh, protocol, uh, believe standard 1.6 now has access to metrology and uh, these variable tables. So you can uh, monitor your machine's quality or the part quality while in process through machine monitoring, which uh, is just a whole new ball game altogether right there. And so much more, just that all this can be done with the power of probing. So, well, after all we talked about, let's revisit the job. Okay. What are we going to do with it? Well, for a hypothetical, we're going to probe the holes first. We get a bunch of holes that are of you know odd sizes, and then we're going to create a macro with the data from those uh, from the probing, and then we're going to place a lot of the x, y, i, j, or r values with variables, things that you've seen me do in the previous examples, and then. In this case, I'm going to add about 50 thou and 100 thou to variables to create coordinates for two passes. If it doesn't make sense right now, it will after you see the code. And then we're going to rinse and repeat because this is a job volume in the thousands. Okay? How would I go about that? What's my approach? Well, this this is the idea that I usually work with. I would write my code as I normally would, uh, just basically, uh, in my case, freehand some code. Um, to accomplish uh, the actual toolpath. And then I'll start filling in the coordinates that you would want to manipulate with variable numbers. Wherever you see that value changing over and over again because of uh, probe data, um, replace that with a variable. Use that probe data to go ahead and fill in those variables. And then you can utilize the outputs from the probing cycles to create the logic that you need. So here's my handwritten code. Okay, just really basic, nothing fancy. Uh, G55, uh, write my G0, got a G3 with R values for my arcs. So I go ahead and do that and create a circle. This is what it would look like if I put in uh, basically the logic and the macros in there. So I have my reset counter to one right here. 901 is the, the variable I chose to use. Okay, then I just insert a program routine. It could be whatever. Uh, Right now, I'm just going to say it's going to yield a one-inch hole, okay? And then I've got a place marker here for the program, N100. Now, variable 900 is another variable I chose to use. And in there, I've put in pound 138 minus 0.1. Uh, that's my 
my math for that. And what does that mean? Let me see if I can bring up the screen here. Okay, so pound 138. What is that? Uh, in some cases, it's a bore boss. So hopefully if it was a bore, I'd have the size from my hole. So if I have the size from my hole, I can go ahead and do any, uh, subtract this 0.1 for a lead-in movement. I've got 902 here. I take the size of my hole, and I'm going to add this uh, reset counter here to 0.05. And this actually counts for my first pass. So my counter right now shows a 1. That means it's my first pass. So first pass times 0.05, that's 50 thou. So this is the value that I want this hole to end up being for my first pass. So I'm going to go through the normal cutting motions here. I've got all that, but instead of putting the actual R values, I've replaced that with my 902, which represents my, my final hole diameter, which is 1.05. Once that's done, you can move over here, and then I have another uh, uh, variable here that adds to the counter. My counter is 901. Now I've added, added a 1. Now there's a 2 in 901. Then I have some if statements here. I have an if statement for if 901 is less than 3, which it is. It's now 2. Go to N100. Go back to N100. Do the same math. And basically, for over here, instead of having 50 thou for the final hole, hole diameter, I've now added 100 thou. That represents my second pass. So because it's a 2 in 901 times 0.05, it's 100 thou. And now I've made a hole that's a uh, hundred thousand bigger. So my end result is 1.1. So I have two passes of 50 thou per, uh, per side or 50 thou depth of cut on the sides. That's how I've gone ahead and probed uh, an oddball shaped hole and added about or subtracted about a hundred thou to that hole size. Or Sorry, added a hundred thou to the hole size for a reskin. Okay, so that's, I know, very confusing, but um, hopefully you should have uh, this example and you can just dig into it, dive into it. Hopefully I made sense when I was explaining it. Um, and again, if you have questions, ask me. So call to action. What do I want you to do from here on out? Uh, first, start probing your parts with SOLIDWORKS CAM. If you got SOLIDWORKS CAM professional or CAMWORKS or any of that, um, you should be able to use probing. Uh, and only it's from 2020 on, I have to uh, add that too. So if you have 2019, unfortunately, you will not be able to use probing. Uh, next, get information from your machine tool provider. If you have a Haas, a Mazak, a, 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 a Herco, uh, go to them and ask them, hey, can I get the variables that represent, say, my tool offsets, my aware offsets, all that stuff, because that becomes very useful for you to create these automation macros. Um, then you can get also the uh, manuals from Renishaw. That's also pretty important too, if you want to start writing your code or your uh, your pickup cycles, because uh, there's more to it than just what SolarWorks Cam uh, provides. There's uh, just a, a full manuals worth of uh, uh, different pickup types. And then just use your imagination, you know, create some macros, have fun, start automating your processes, just be a lot more dangerous than you already are in the shop. Um, take what you know and uh, see if you can, you know, make it work out and do something uh, uh, that uh, is interesting and automated. Thank you, guys.